here with us today is Richard Moltzman, who is a senior lecturer at Boston University Metropolitan College, an award-winning author and speaker on sustainability and project management. Richard, I would like to welcome you and thank you for doing this interview. We are honored to have you with us today. I'm glad to be here. Great. You have worked in the industry for 40 years and focused on project management for the past 29 of those years. You have worked as a PMO director on various projects and currently you work as a consultant and teach at the Boston University Metropolitan College. What led you to also focus on consulting and teaching? Mm -hmm. So I um, found that teaching has been part of my career. It, it, it's almost like being an accidental project manager. I became an accidental project manager and mm, consultant and teacher at, at some of my positions at work. And I found that that was one of the parts of the job that I liked the most. Um, and to the subject of this uh, interview, one of the things I liked the least was attending four meetings. Through all the years of your professional development, uh, what did you find to be most important for ensuring the success of a project? Um, through the years of development as well as actual projects, I'd say the, the one thing that made um, projects more successful was the ability of the project leader to engage their team, that is to um, form uh, an atmosphere of um, optimism and uh, a sense of direction for the completed project and keep that end goal in, in mind and constantly um, amongst the team members. Uh, obviously, uh, technical knowledge of whatever discipline was important. Um, my, my, my business was telecom, but uh, overarching and beyond the technical um, expertise, it was important for the individual to be able to build and motivate and influence the team. You are one of the founders of EarthPM, a project management and consulting company that thinks about the planet's future. You have also spoken about sustainability in project management for many years back. Can you tell us more about the intersection of sustainability and project management? What are the benefits for both the environment and for organizations, especially in the long run? Yes, so uh, one of the key uh, assertions that uh, EarthPM makes is that there should, there should be a strong linkage between the mission, vision, and values of an organization, whatever organization, whether it's a, a for-profit uh, petrochemical company or a non-profit uh, social um, projects company um, organization, um, it's important for there to be a strong link between what the company says they're all about, and uh, that includes economics, and the um, projects that they launch. What that translates to is that project managers need to consider the product of the project, whether it's a service or a physical product, in the longer term. So if you're producing um, something that ends up using energy uh, in, the, in the longer run, then you should be considering how much energy it uses. So, for example, if you're responsible for the paving of a new roadway, um, the surface that you use, you can find a very inexpensive material, uh, pave the road, and it might yield much poorer fuel efficiency for the vehicles traveling on it or you could invest a little bit more, uh, and in the longer run, it's going to have a better result for the, let's say, the taxpayers that are funding that road surface. So in decision-making, project managers are better off in providing true quality, which is the long-term benefits realization. They're better off providing longer-term, higher-quality benefits if they consider what the product of the project does. And what that means is that they have to think through the end of the project. They have to think through a year, two years, five, ten, sometimes even a century past, uh, which I know is heresy for project managers because projects have a definitive start and finish. Um, but in the thinking, in the planning, um, 
the mindset should include the outcome of the project in the longer term, and it makes you a better project manager, especially in the area of risk identification. Why is it important for companies to stress the triple bottom line thinking? Why would focusing on the three Ps help managers move a step closer to achieving absolute project success? Well, I think the important answer here is the definition of success. And in uh, some of our books, we talk about the difference between PM success, which is being on scope, on budget, and within schedule. Um, and that's important, of course, as opposed to project success. And the difference is that project success means that whatever it is that you're delivering does what it's supposed to do for its customers and other stakeholders for the longer period of time. So, for example, the Sydney Opera House is a great example of a project that had terrible PM success. It was way over budget. Uh, it went through many design changes and firings of architects. Um, and yet, its product, the Sydney Opera House, is considered a symbol of Australia. So that's a project that had project success, but not great project management success. I think a lot of us focus on achieving great PM success, but ignore, or at least don't enough, and don't consider enough, the project success. Triple bottom line, meaning social, economic, and ecological success means that whatever it is that your project delivers in the longer term uh, does not injure the planet in some way. For example, produce a plastic, a non-recyclable plastic uh, outcome that's going to be going into landfills or a, an absurd amount of uh, use of energy uh, or uh, other toxic chemicals or some kind of non-safe condition um, like a plane, uh, an unsafe airplane. Uh, because you met the budget. In fact, um, in the news today, there's a lot of uh, stories about the uh, Boeing 737 MAX. And uh, the um, it's not proven yet, but the, the rush to deliver that plane on time and within budget because of competitive pressures may have led to decisions and practices that, again, not proven, may have led to decisions and practices that caused a, a less than desirable, much less than desirable, uh, longer term outcome. Mm -hmm. So I think when we consider the triple bottom line, we're, we're talking about economic sustainability. There's nothing wrong with making money for a long time. <laughs> I think we'll all agree with that. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. But we also consider um, the ecological or environmental and the social aspects and considering those up front may save a lot of pain later because of the cost of poor quality. Our project management audience should be familiar with the uh, concept of, um, from Philip Crosby, quality is free, and therefore should be familiar with the concept of cost of poor quality and cost of uh, good quality. Uh, I'm a big advocate. I think the triple bottom line thinking is very much along the lines of cost of good quality. Money invested now, time invested now, and doing things right is going to pay off, um, even though you, you, even though it costs and make, may make the project statistics look a little bit poorer, the project management statistics. The project's outcome will, like the Sydney Opera House, end up being a symbol, uh, a monument even to your success. Why is the longevity of a project significant and how does it affect the work of project managers? What makes looking beyond a project end date so important, even in the early stages? Well, again, I think it's important for a project manager to look out beyond the end of the project. By doing so, they'll do a much, much better job of identifying the, the more overarching threats and opportunities that a project might have. So I think the longer view, um, considering economics, environment, and social aspects, so broad and longer term, uh, will, will, will have you do a better job of uh, identifying threats and opportunities and We'll build better morale because people in a project team don't want to do things that either will not contribute economically for a long time or that might hurt the environment 
or that might cause problems for the local workers or the, the uh, surrounding community. Uh, that's a morale buster. So um, I think people feel better about a project if the project manager builds an attitude that says we are more all-encompassing in our thinking. In 2011, you received the Cleveland Award for Literature for your book, Green Project Management, that you co-authored with David Shirley. In this book, you mm -hmm. explore the processes necessary to move an organization and its projects much higher on the scale of, as you call it, greenality, and show how that high score would positively affect the bottom line. Uh, can you explain, in short, how those high greenality scores can be gained? I think it has to do with the amount of time and effort and the scope of thinking in project planning. And it really comes back to, to planning. I mean, the, the Timbuk Guide, uh, the vast majority of the processes uh, are in um, the plurality, anyway, of processes is in uh, planning. And that's not an accident. Uh, a well-planned project is a, is a much more likely to succeed project, and I mean in both senses, PM success and project success. Uh, so a high granality score, that's a term we coined, um, was uh, reflective of a, of a project management philosophy that is broad in its scope and that takes uh, the triple bottom line thinking and long-term thinking into, into its scope. And so what's interesting about this is that the first book, which did win the um, first book on sustainability, Green Project Management, which did win the Cleveland Award for Literature, we're very proud of that. Um, I'm also proud of PMI for, forget, forget me and Dave, it, it honored a book about sustainability, which is, I think, something in and of itself of note. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we're proud that PMI chose that topic as well as that it happened to pick us. Um, I think that it's important for project managers to, um, to take, this, uh, take this into account, and it's, it's going to make their projects, um, again, successful from a PM perspective and an overall product or service delivery perspective. In your book, Project Workflow Management, a Business Process Approach, which you co-authored with Daniel Epstein, you speak about redirecting to an alternative path in the event of project issues. How can managers handle arising problems during a project's life cycle? Are the problems something that can be easily bypassed, or do they require a certain kind of approach and special attention? Yes, well, uh, in that book, we, we outline a kind of a flow, in fact, that, that that book has a, uh, a lot of illustrations, physical illustrations, and those illustrations are in the realm of flowcharts. So um, Daniel and I uh, have covered project management almost from a flow perspective. Is it easy to, to have an alternate flow? No, but the key again, it goes back to planning. If you've done the appropriate planning and your flowcharts encompass lots of if-thens, not just a straight forward Gantt chart that says we do this and then we do this. It's more like we do this and we would do this if this happens. That means we have to identify, um, st step back, do a very good job of identifying what those if-thens are. In other words, what the potential um, uncertainties, uh, and if we know the, the, the risk percentages, the, the risks involved, um, actually, I think it's important uh, for project managers to know the difference between uncertainty and risk. These are not synonyms, right? Uncertainty is unknown unknowns. These are things that, you know, it's a, a, an outcome, you don't even know what possible types of outcomes there are, as opposed to a risk where you know there's a 37% chance of um, poor weather on your construction site and a 73% chance of, 63% uh, chance, never great with now. 63% uh, chance of, uh, of good weather. That's risk management. In either case, you should have, uh, you should have a lot of consideration about these alternate paths your project can take. Remember, a project is very predictive in nature. We are, uh, we are looking into the future. Every task that we say is going to be seven days 
we know that that's, we should know, that that's not necessarily 7.0 days. It might be 3 to 12 days. We're leaning a little more heavily towards the 12. And the better that information is about a particular task or about overall descript the overall description of the project, the more of these alternate tasks we have documented. And if you're following the project workflow management philosophy, you would actually have that all diagrammed out. And if not, you at least have a detailed risk register that shows um, one by one what these uncertainties are, when you know the risks, what those risk percentages are, and um, also, of course, most importantly, uh, you have thought through a risk response plan for each of these. How important is it for project managers to be able to immediately respond appropriately to any issue that arises during the project life cycle? Well, of course, the answer is it depends because some issues are going to be relatively minor. Um, I guess the phrase I like to use is you pick your battles. Um, some of these issues might not even they might be very low on the uh, impact scale, and some uh, might be life, literally life-threatening. Obviously, one of the key things you need to do is sort out urgency and importance when it comes to issues. So there actually is a tool called the Eisenhower Matrix, which I coach people to use, where you, you look at uh, four quadrants of low and high urgency and low and high importance. And you focus your attention on those issues which are high in both, <laughs> very high urgency and very high in importance. Um, and put, apportion your time to spending very little on those that are low in urgency and low in importance. Uh, many people just see issues as issues, and because many of us come from a, a, a technical engineering background, we see um, a to-do list uh, uh, to tick off uh, items one by one, not prioritizing them first. So we feel like we have a, works, a, a day's worth of work done if we got seven out of eight issues solved, and yet the one we didn't solve is the one that's going to come and destroy us. Maybe we should have started with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, in your book, How to Facilitate Productive Project Planning Meetings, that you co-authored with Jim Stewart. There is a section about managing tough personalities in meetings. Having a plan rarely goes smoothly with the so-called disruptors, who you also refer to as goblins in your book. What solution would you suggest for dealing with these tough personalities? Yes, so yeah, we call them meeting goblins. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a section of the book where we talk about, for example, um, people who are uh, just not really good at being quiet in the meetings and they're making a lot of noise in the background and how do you deal, how do you deal with these, these particular individuals? And we have oh, roughly a couple of paragraphs on each. Um, if you want an example, um, one of the, uh, one of the examples might be just someone who's very, very talkative. We call him, uh, Gary, the garrulous goblin. Um, and one of the one of the tips we have is uh, literally to um, walk over to the person, uh, physically w walk over to the person, because uh, you you have legs. And as a meeting facilitator, you can use those legs. You don't have to stay fixed like a statue to the front of the room. Uh, it's, it's tempting because we have our pointer and our screen and our PowerPoint behind us to stand there as if it's our castle or our um, our lecture podium, uh, we have the ability to walk around. And you might just slowly walk over to the person and stand over them. And um, th that usually quiets them down. It turns out that's actually a trick that uh, I, I gained from my daughter, who's a middle school teacher, and I uh, have to give her credit for that. Um, she says sometimes she'll just not say anything to the person who's talking a lot and just move herself over to that area. and your physical presence gets them to quiet down. I mean, there's a whole list of tips like that uh, for each of these um, meeting goblins. And we've all seen them. And some of us have even been them. So sometimes it, it pays to just reflect on, when have I been Tina, the tangent goblin, and taken a meeting off on a tangent? And what would I have wanted? Um, how would I have wanted the meeting facilitator 
to uh, to correct me. Uh, so even even applying a little bit of self study, self uh, uh, self awareness can help. And put yourself in the shoes of each of these goblins and say, boy, you know what? I think I've done that myself. What would have shut me up or what would have put me back on topic? This book is a practical guide to planning meetings. Could you tell us a bit about the kind of guidance you offer? What would be the best way to approach project planning? How important is it for project managers to actually conduct effective planning meetings? <laughs> so those are basically the chapters in the, in the book. Mm -hmm. So you asked very good questions, um, the answer of which is the book. <laughs> yes. but, um, we we spend uh, we did some research. So this is a book that we wrote together. The two of us have something like uh, 75 years worth of um, uh, project experience. Um, a lot of it in meetings. We also reached out to many many colleagues in project management, taking advantage of LinkedIn uh, and other networks. Um, so the, the opinions in here are our own. We also have war stories from many dozens of others. Um, we do cover the importance uh, of uh, planning for meetings. We do uh, basically ask project managers to step back and say, you know, your project planning meeting is somewhat of a project itself. Your pickoff meeting, which is a very important one, for example. And maybe you should just take the time to plan it like a project. In other words, if you just simply apply some of the tools that we use in the project itself in playing the event of the meeting, including all the logistics and the, the formulation of the agenda, uh, you, will, you will have a better outcome. Um, I should also mention that this book was intentionally written also somewhat as a project management primer. Uh, it's not the main intent of the book, but threaded throughout the book, you will find, you know, what's a WBS and how do you use it? What's a Gantt chart and how is that used? Um, how do you do? A, how do you create and plot a heat map or risk um, probability impact matrix? Um, all of that, all those fundamentals, because they're part of a project planning meeting, are threaded through this book. So this this book may have more value than we had expected because um, in talking with other PMI chapters and they've read through the book and they've asked, asked us to speak. Um, they've said, you know what, you actually have written a fairly good uh, introduction to project management book. And we, we warn people that's not the intent. And we certainly wouldn't want anyone reading this book with the intent to learn how to manage a project as it's as the only book they read. Um, but it does have that aspect to it. Okay, the last question. What kind of advice would you give project managers that would like to integrate sustainability in their workplace? How can they make others in their company see sustainability not as a constraint, but as an instrument that would yield success? So uh, for this, I'll, I'll go back to an old blog post that for now, right now seems like it was posted in 1843. <laughs> That's how long ago it seems. Um, and we called it the, the three-click challenge. And it's a pretty simple. The idea, and this relates to those of us who know the movie The Wizard of Oz. Um, hopefully most people do know this movie I found in traveling uh, around the world. Um, the the three-click challenge involves um, the organization you're in, go to its homepage, whatever organization, if it's a, a provincial government or um, a commercial company, volunteer organization, go to the go to the web page of the organization and click on About Us and see how many clicks it takes to get to a statement of some kind about the um, dedication that the organization has to the community or to the environment. So for example, if you were to go to Patagonia's web page, um, I think it, within two clicks you get to the state their statements about their um, mission to be kind to the planet, so to speak. Uh, but you could go to a company that makes toothpaste or uh, that produces architectural designs, and still you will probably find some statements. So the three-click challenge is to locate those um, mission, vision, values types of statements about the connection that the company has, not the projects, but the company has to sustainability. And you'll find it. Uh, these days, almost every company will have some kind of connection like that. So what's the three-click 
the three-click challenge, find that connection, and then realize that this is a source of power for you as a project manager. Realize that because the company at the highest uh, levels is stating in their mission and vision that we will, for example, reduce emissions of our company or we will become carbon neutral by 2020. These are powerful statements issued by your leaders, the leaders of your company, um, carried out through strategies, and those strategies are then um, launching, initiating projects. So it's a source of power, power that you've had all along, and that's the connection to the Wizard of Oz, because Dorothy, if you'll remember, she was told by the Good Witch that all she had to do to go home was, if you remember, click her heels three times and say there's no place like home. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you, like Dorothy, had the power all along to bring sustainability into your organization uh, simply by clicking three times, or so to speak, um, linking the mission values and vision of your company to your particular projects. And this is something that I have worked hard to build into the curriculum uh, at uh, Boston University. I just want to make this statement. I think it's important. I'm trying to get young, new, and sometimes experienced, very experienced project managers who are going for a master's certificate or a master's degree uh, at Boston University. Um, we work this into the curriculum. So one of the first assignments a project management student does is to um, make this connection, is to uh, find a company of their choice, locate their mission and vision statements, and then find a project that has been launched and make sure that it is in some way or another connected to the mission. Whether or not it has something to do with saving trees and saving whales, it doesn't have to be that directly green. It just has to, um, we just have to increase that linkage between a company's mission, vision, and values and whatever project that they're running. So that's a long answer, but it's, a, it's an important enough question to deserve a long answer. Yes, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Anna.